All right, hi folks. Thanks for joining us. In just a few minutes, Jade will be joining as well. Um, so while we wait for her, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. And I am Olivia Maya Ortiz. I'm an educator here at the School for Advanced Research's Indian Arts Research Center. And thanks for logging in tonight. Um, we're gonna be doing another segment of our SAR Artist Live series, which is an opportunity for viewers to jump behind the scenes and into the workspaces of many talented artists. Tonight, I'm speaking to you from Ogapoge Owinge White Shell Water Place, which is also known as Santa Fe, New Mexico. And this program is partially funded by the City of Santa Fe Arts and Culture Department and the 1% Lodgers Tax. So this season of SAR Artists Live will be further exploring the exhibition Grounded in Clay, The Spirit of Pueblo Pottery. And this exhibition is curated by the Native American communities it represents. This project gives authority and voice to the Pueblo Pottery Collective, um, which is a group of over 60 individuals who come from 21 different tribal communities and who selected and wrote about pieces from two significant Pueblo Pottery Collections, um, which is the Indian Arts Research Centers here at SAR, um, and also the Vilcek Foundation of New York. And I see jo Jade joined, so I'm going to go ahead and try to add her as a moderator. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad that worked. Hey. Hi, thanks for joining. I really yeah. appreciate it. I was uh, mumbling through some introductions before you you logged on and folks are slowly logging into um oh great awesome happy it worked out um yeah <laughs> so i would just go ahead and formally introduce you then i was just about at that point i was explaining what grounded in clay is and the collections that folks wrote about um so tonight we have jade begay who's with us of tisuke pueblo and Dene heritage and who is an indigenous rights organizer um she's the climate Justice Campaign Director for Indian Collective and serves on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Um, she works at the intersection of climate justice and environmental justice with an emphasis on indigenous rights and leadership. Um, she's also an artist in her own right um, with the primary mode of storytelling as I understand it being um, through filmmaking, which I'm excited to hopefully chat about that tonight, too. Um, Jade is our first guest in our Grounded in Clay series, so somewhat of a guinea pig here. Thanks for your patience and indulging me. And um, tonight we're just going to talk about um, your experiences being a community curator for the exhibition and just general ref reflections on the themes that are. Um, would you like to introduce yourself in your own words, Jade? Sure, yeah. Um, well, uh, Otamu and Yate, everyone, my name is Jade Begay. Um, I think you gave a great intro, um, just kind of high level. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I live and am based in Santa Fe, New Mexico, also known as Oga Po Oge. Um, in Tewa, that translates to uh, White Shell Place, and um, Santa Fe is uh, traditional Tewa lands. My my homelands, um, as I am from Tisuke Pueblo, as you mentioned, and also have Diné um, um, heritage. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, the other, I would just be repeating you, but I think <laughs> my, my work in um, advocacy and activism, uh, specifically around climate and environmental issues, um, in addition, in my so-called spare time, I do film work. I'm able to work as a producer or director, and that's yeah, that's um, more or less more or less what I'm up to. So I'm, I'm personally a big fan of your work, so I'm excited to to oh, talk about thanks. this stuff. I guess. A good starting point is um, maybe with the exhibition and some your entry was really beautiful and compelling and just to give people some context you wrote about two pieces and when got to 
Anastasia Duran, and then the other is a San Alfonso Bowl by Maria and Tracy Martinez. Um, and in your writing, you discuss your early memories of public pottery, and, and it, it's just these beautiful images of elders working with the clay, and the smell of your surroundings, and, you know, dancing to the golden rain. So I guess my first kind of question or jumping off point is if you can tell us about how some of the personal experiences that you wrote about, you know, and perhaps with climate change at an earlier age influenced you into the work and advocacy that you do now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I'm mean, really excited for folks to see this show um, and just hear um, of all the ways that, you know, um, different Pueblo people have been connecting or reconnecting with different pieces that, you know, some date back thousands of years, hundreds, hundreds of years. Um, the pieces that I chose are a little bit more modern, um, but still have a lot of, uh, yeah, impact, I guess, on who, who I am and the, the symbols and the art that are on these pieces. Um, you know, I, yeah, I can remember seeing them as far back as being a child and they, they do represent um, different reasons to why I do the work I do. And I'm, I reference this in my, um, my writing of the two pieces that I chose. And uh, essentially, you know, growing up, um, being, being so privileged to grow up really close um, to my community, in my community, and very close to um, our traditions, um, and I, I, I say that that is a privilege because not all Indigenous or Native people are able to do that. Some people have been, you know, displaced or their families have been displaced or um, assimilated or, you know, removed from their territories. And so I find it really um, such an honor and just really humbling to be able to grow up um, and still live like in very close proximity to my culture and my language. Um, so growing up in that, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's all of the things that uh, make up like our, our community and our, um, the, the ways we hold pr uh, ceremony and different traditional practices throughout the year that have made me really um, observe the seasons in particular and have reverence for the elements that come with certain seasons. So in, in the spring, for instance, you know, the entire community is really focused on um, on clearing acequias, on preparing the land for seeds. And then in the summer, you know, uh, well, prior to the really dry, hot time of the summer, we're really focused on traditional practices that call in rain. And um, most people in Santa Fe, um, or some people in Santa Fe may have been to um, like the corn dance that usually happens um, in early June. And that is a practice that is meant to call in rain so that we have an abundant um, harvest in the fall. And, and so I can go on and on, but the, the point is, is that over my lifetime, I've seen these practices impacted by changes in the environment, changes in our ecosystem. Um, and uh, yeah, we can call all of that climate change. Um, I, I just referenced the the dances that took place in early June. Um, you know, we we were able once to wash and cleanse in a stream or a river that moved through our our village, and now that stream doesn't run. It's just it doesn't run. And sometimes there's a tiny, tiny you know stream of water, but not enough. And, and so these are some of the ecological changes that I've seen just in my relatively short lifetime. And that 
is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to see, you know, traditional practices changed or shifted or adapted because of, of climate change. And, and knowing that my community um, and a lot of indigenous and um, native communities have done so little to contribute to climate change. Um, and so in my, um, in my writing for this show, I, I, t I speak to the symbols that are represented on these pots or the rain god um, that Tsuke Pueblo is re really known for, really famous for. And um, I speak to what it, what it means to, yeah, hold, hold these symbols in reverence um, as we're experiencing climate change and, and what it means to um, call on these these spirits, these symbols, um, Avanu, who is the serpent that represents um, forces of nature and then the rain god, you know, what does it mean to fortify ourselves and call upon these spirits um, to, yeah, make us stronger as we, as we move through uncertain, um, uncertain times. Yeah, this is, I mean, those are all great points and a lot to unpack. After the devastating fires we just saw in Santa Fe, it, it, we can see what's happening around our environments, and it's really sad to see certain areas closed off from, you know, where normal normal uh, clay picking might happen. For example, if we're relating it back to, to pottery, um, I know that in your role within Indian Collective, you delivered um, congressional committee testimony. Um, I think late, late last year, like in December sometime, um, that kind of spoke to um, land leasing to gas and oil industries and how they threaten especially indigenous black and brown bodies um, of color and life ways and culture. And um, I guess just to further demonstrate the overlap of um, Pueblo pottery and environmental justice. Can you speak a little bit to to what you were sharing during that testimony or if you can relate it to the the pieces that we see in the exhibition somehow? Just curious. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's possible to draw connections. Um, so yeah, thank you for referencing that moment. That was a huge opportunity. Um, to testify to Congress um, on behalf of the land, on behalf of you know our sacred places and our sacred lands, um, to say no more, no more fossil fuel leasing on public lands. Um, not only you know is it a violation um, to indigenous rights um, and. Uh, to you know uh, our our traditional knowledge, but it's also not taking us in the direction we need to go as far as um, as far as decarbonizing and uh, and reaching our climate targets. So that was the main main point um, in that uh, testimony, and uh, of course there were multiple multiple um, points kind of hitting on statistics, you know, there are already, I think, upwards of, um, well, there's like multiple thousands of unused oil and gas wells already in existence. So the fact that the government is leasing more onshore leases, um, onshore is reference to oil and gas leases on the land. Um, obvious, but I, I feel like some of these terms, you know, not always, um, al not always super accessible. So just wanted to, yeah, clarify. I but, um, <laughs> yeah, but um, there's, there's plenty of leases out there. So we don't need any new leases. Um, and so uh, just really wanting to remind the administration about, you know, those, um, those facts, but also, um, yeah, uplift, you know, what is already um, going on as far as climate impacts in the, U in the Western part of the US. Um, we're already seeing just so much devastation, heat waves, wildfires, mudslides in Yellowstone, you know, the list goes on and on. And um, the more we 
the more we drill, the more we open public lands for oil and gas, then the more, you know, climate change is ex exacerbated. So um, that what that led to a partial win. So um, let's see, we made the testimonies and it wasn't just me, there were also three other people from New Mexico who testified um, during that um, hearing. And then in April, I believe, April, I believe, don't quote me on that, time is <laughs> time <laughs> funky. Um, but in April, March or April, um, the Department of Interior, and Interior announced that they would reduce oil and new oil and gas leases for onshore um, by 80%. So, of course, it's not 100%. We, we, that's what we were striving for. So a little disappointed there, but also 80% is huge. 80% is a good amount of reduction. So we're still fighting for that 100%. But I think to your question of like, what is the connection between um, doing work that fights the fossil fuel industry? Um, I mean, you know, I couldn't think of a of a site off the top of my head, but there are places um, I'm sure that. Um, sorry, I need to turn off vacations. I forgot to do the same. I'm just not as popular as you right now. Okay, so, so I think the the connection is that. Um, whether it's here in New Mexico, whether it's in Alaska, whether it's in Texas, oil and gas um, leases or infrastructure could um, impact, you know, places where people harvest things such as clay or, or other materials to make um, baskets, to make um, medicines, you know, all of the, the materials we, we harvest and collect to make the things that are traditionally significant to us, culturally significant to us, could be threatened by, um, you know, whether it's oil and gas leasing, whether it's pipelines, um, uh, just industrial infrastructure. And so these are the reasons why we fight these fights is to protect um, not just our, our knowledge, not just the knowledge of knowing of, of pottery or what have you, basket weaving, et cetera, but the, the actual materials that come from earth and that need a healthy earth to be able to survive. Yeah, I think a lot of folks maybe who are not from you know, surrounding communities here might not understand how integral the process is to what Pueblo pottery is and that the environment is so, you know, so closely connected. I mean, it is, it is part of it, it's intimately tied. Um, one, if you'll indulge me here, one exhibition theme that we have, um, we have four exhibition themes um, for Grounded in Clay. And one of them is focused on ancestors and I'm personally really interested in the idea of future ancestors and re remembering forward so in the same way that you mm -hmm. wrote about these two pieces that you selected um you know what mm -hmm. do you think that you know you as a future ancestor one day and in the spirit of remembering forward can you tell us what you think these two pottery pieces that you chose what their voices might say about the contemporary moment we're in now one day in the future, if that question makes sense. <laughs> mm, yeah. Ooh, yeah. I. It's a. It's Sorry a to really throw that. <laughs> no, it's yeah. a great question, and I'm just trying to like in real time think. Um, so yeah, the I wish I had. I wish we had the pieces to show folks here. Yeah. Uh, so one piece is a rain god, um, which. Uh, yeah, is is absolutely, you know, with with its name represents rain and abundance, but also um, these are really cute little figurines and they're really sweet and they evoke a lot of joy. And so I think with that one in particular and thinking of futurism, 
um, and also connecting my work, you know, there's, um, in my work at Indian Collective, there's a saying, um, uh, kind of like a, yeah, a question that we hold um, to ourselves to, uh, to really, you know, reflect around what we are building, what we are creating. And the question is, what if the best times are ahead of us? And so when I think about the rain god and this little figure who is just, you know, oh, so happy and, oh, yay. <laughs> I see it. For folks. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt So cute. <laughs> um, so, yeah, when I think of these figures and what their message is for, you know, us moving into the future is, is to bring that joy with us and that it's um it's important for us to imagine the future being better um being a joyful place otherwise you know what 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 are we really doing what are we really working for um and then with the the other piece i wonder if we can grab that as well with the yes so the black micace the, or this it, actually i don't think it's micaceous but yeah i think that's micaceous oh okay Dan yes. El Defonso, i know Bull. right so the symbols the symbol the serpent um yeah being really a force uh, a symbol of the forces of nature um you know i think we have a lot of humbling um we're going to be very humbled by forces of nature in in the future and we are now um we are seeing heat waves across the world really um unfortunately taking a toll on on people and and really it's um yeah it's awful it's it's really hard and people are struggling and it's a challenge to meet the need of everyone but i think just you know in relation to the work that i do i think just uh really being humble in the face of climate change that you know we are um mother nature is the one making the calls right now and <laughs> we have to be really um respectful to you know the shifts that we've caused and i think um and really heed the signs that mother nature is and the forces of nature are are showing us and um, and and try to do the things that are able to calm, you know, the 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 climate change that we've we've started. We, you know, humans have have made, and and more so than than some. Definitely, you know, industry, um, corporate uh, entities are more responsible than, um, you know, for for example, indigenous communities by far. Um, but yeah, I think just um, this this piece of Vanu of Avanu on the on the black pottery just giving us a message of of being humble to the forces of nature. Well, well, I'll carry that message with me personally. It's refreshing to have you know an optimistic message in these times. I think we're inundated yeah. with a lot of other negativity and. A lot of what you're saying, I think that connects back to, you know, why, why folks in our, in our moment are calling further for land back and attention to indigenous science and just really important. Mm -hmm. topics. Um, so I appreciate hearing your perspective. I really love that message. Um, I guess some kind of unrelated question that I personally wanted to just hear a little bit from you about is your recent Elevation grant and the project you're working on, and that's a film project. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about what that project is and where your thinking is at with it currently? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much for, yeah, touching on just so many different aspects of, um, of my work. And I think there's, um, yeah, I can get really caught up in the weeds of everything and I'm, I forget to zoom out and be like, oh yeah, there's this other thing going on. Um, but this is a, so um, I was lucky to receive a grant from 
um, a, a, a coalition of brands, Marmot, um, who is an outdoor recreational brand, as well as Sony Alpha um, and uh, Smart Will, Smart Wool. So um, they came together and uh, put a grant together. So, you know, for all those folks who are emerging storyteller, filmmakers, photographers, this grant is, is going to be done in cycles. So um, shameless plug for, yeah, folks just keeping track of that, especially, oh, and it's, uh, it's specifically for BIPOC storytellers. So I was um, a recipient of that. And I also Janelle, who just, I, I saw Janelle joined the live. Um, anyways, just shout out to, yeah, that community, but um, uh, was able to use uh, those resources to start up a project that I've been really wanting to evolve from just the idea phase um, or state. Um, and the, the concept is, um, or rather the concept comes from this childhood curiosity about the Athabascan language family. Um, so I, I mentioned at the top of the live that I'm, I'm Diné. I'm um, on my father's side, I'm Diné. And uh, yeah, I've always been told from a, a, being a young person that we have relatives in the North that there were these migrations that happened long, long time ago. And um, yeah, either we came from the north or we traveled back and forth, you know, we, we don't really know. Um, and so I've always been fascinated with those stories. And now in my adulthood, in the work that I do um, for climate, issue, climate justice issues, um, I, I've traveled to Alberta, Canada, or Fort Chippewa Territory. I've traveled to Alaska. So that region, you know, those folks call themselves uh, Diné. So there's the Diné in the north and the Diné in the south. Um, and we're, we're definitely cousins, like distant, distant, distant cousins. But the, um, the languages are similar. Um, I've read books. Um, on, on this topic. And there's actually, with the Diné um, language, for example, Diné Bizad, um, it's, it's more similar to some, um, like the Iyak language in, in Southeast Alaska than Iyak is to like other Alaskan languages. So there's these really interesting connections, um, not just with language, but with culture and with story. And so the project um, that I've been able to jumpstart with the Elevation Grant is, is to explore and go into depth and also archive the stories around this Athabascan. Um, and actually Athabascan is a colonial term. Um, I'm calling the project the Na Dene. Um, story it, it's untitled right now but <laughs> so far just referencing the not the because that's the more um that's the indigenous way of referencing that whole language family um anyways yeah it's very much in uh research and development right now we've um we've shot a a, a very mini trailer that you can see on the marmot um instagram and website um, but yeah, it's, it's gonna be a journey, um, making this into a full, uh, full film project or film series. Um, and it's, it's so much to share and I'm just, um, really excited for it to evolve. And if people are interested and have stories about this topic in particular, like, please reach out. I am definitely open to collaborators. That's and clap here. Do you have the tentative date of when you think it might be completed and ready to view, or is that too too soon? I now? don't. <laughs> I don't. Not to put uh, you on the spot. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. I I'm taking my time with this one. Um, it's it's a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of 
relationship building and really diving into uh you know these these multiple cultures because it's it's all the way from like the gwich'in of the arctic in alaska all the way you know there's some um athabascan tribes in california um here in new mexico Diné, apache and then and then all the way to northern mexico so it's a huge geographical um space to cover as far as you know the stories to collect um so this is why collaborating is important and also there's the cultural um there's the cultural timelines to follow so a lot of these um these cultures that are being referenced and featured in the project um, are their storytelling time is in the winter. So <laughs> in the summer, we're technically just paused because you meet people who are who are very traditional um, or just very, uh, you know, connected to culture and they don't they want to share their stories during the right time of the year. So that's also something that we're um, very respectful of and want to honor and so we move with the seasons and like i said we're we're very conscious and and respectful to those um cultural um timelines that's great um that, that could really be a healthy way to work too rather than i think we're often inundated inundated with the message to just be super productive all the time get things done and um, yeah get to go at a different pace um, yeah, so absolutely. I look forward to learning more about that project. And that's why I wanted to ask. And I would argue that it does relate to this exhibition because the curators have their own lived experiences that, you know, we have to better understand. Um, so I think it's yeah. all connected. <laughs> oh, um. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a huge piece in, in storytelling. And, you know, there's always um, or a huge um, lesson in storytelling, rather, you know, we're always hearing um, of different messages and tips and guides on how to be, you know, non-extractive storytellers. And I, the one thing I see referenced the least is following cultural timelines, that there are certain times of the year where stories are told, and we can't rush those, and we can't shift those um, we have to really honor and respect those timelines and so yeah i think um you know there i might have seen some some film people join but um yeah if you're a film person that's something definitely to advocate for great well thank you um believe it or not 30 minutes flies by so i just want to yeah. thank you again for your flexibility and it was really nice to connect um and I look forward to hopefully seeing you at an opening here or sometime <laughs> around, you know, the Grounded in Clay exhibition, which for folks who are watching right now, um, Grounded in Clay, the Spirit of Pueblo Pottery is organized by SAR and the Vilcek Foundation and curated by the Pueblo Pottery Collective. It debuts on July 31st, which is next weekend. Can't believe it's already that time. Um, and it'll be here at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. And then it will travel nationally in 2023. So if you're in the area, we definitely hope to see you. Our public opening is next Sunday. It's free to all folks and we're gonna have a lot of fun stuff going on. And Jay, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. You're the you're the first one to, to do it. this. So yeah, like I said, you were the okay. guinea pig. <laughs> the guinea pig. Um, yes. ha happy to give it the first go and just <laughs> yeah. Um, unfortunately, I won't be at the opening. I'll actually be in Alaska. Um, oh wow! But uh, really honored to be a part of this project and this series. And um, yeah, so far the book and just all the curation has has just been really beautiful to to see and hold and i'm just so grateful that this is happening and thanks everyone for joining i'm seeing friends um thanks yes. for taking time to listen <laughs> i think we all learned something new from you today so mm. <laughs> awesome right. 
Thanks, folks. Well, have a great evening. Stay safe. Bye. Stay well. We'll see you soon. In about two weeks, we'll do another one of these um, artist lives, and we'll we'll keep you in the loop. So keep an eye on our feeds. Awesome. Bye, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>